Additionally, I'm Senior Vice President for Europe and Eurasia here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We're delighted to welcome you here. We have a very special discussion for you this morning. I have to say a lot of CSIS's work is obviously poised on the, the challenges, the security crises of the moment, but this morning's discussion is actually something I wish we did a little bit more of, which was talking about best practices. What can we learn from other countries as they're meeting uh, new technological challenges and new opportunities? And we are delighted to have our two colleagues from the Estonian Information System Authority with us to talk about Estonia's digital evolution. I'm just going to bore you for one minute with one story that I have. Uh, it was my first visit to Tallinn, Estonia uh, at the very end of 2001. And uh, I was there as part of a, a delegation of U.S. officials as we were looking at uh, Estonia's candidacy to become a NATO member. And so we had a meeting with the Prime Minister's office. We were ushered in and we walked past the cabinet room. And the cabinet room was this extraordinary room. It was just with, with computer monitors. And, and, and it goes, oh, yes, this is our new uh, cabinet room. We're paperless. We just do everything on the computers. And, and uh, it's, it's very efficient. And I walk in, OK. And we sit down with the prime minister's advisors and staff. And we start talking about corruption and how does Estonia address corruption. I'm like, oh, no, everything is online. All our tenders, all our procurements, you can go look at it. It's fine. That's, that's a very transparent e-government. And I went, boy. I wish we had that. And so in many ways, what a wonderful example uh, of a country that's taking a leadership role in an area and what can we learn from them. But fast forwarding six years later, we also saw the more uh, insidious nature of e-governance when Estonia suffered from the most significant cyber attack in 2007 after the Bronze Night incident, and where we learned that there are other actors that use, uh, use this wonderful tool of e-governance and can be very harmful. So we've seen both the opportunities and the challenges. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity to dig a little deeper, have two of Estonia's foremost experts tell us about both those opportunities and challenges. We're delighted to have with us Daniel Shenuk, Executive Director of the Center for Business Government at IBM, who will be with us to moderate this discussion and introduce our two speakers. You're in for a wonderful presentation, and I know you have a lot of questions, so we look forward to a rich discussion. And uh, with your applause, will you please welcome Daniel Shinnok to the podium? Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Um, thanks to CSIS for hosting a very informative and interesting discussion that I know we'll have this morning. Uh, thanks to the Estonian government for lending two of their leaders uh, to us here this morning. Uh, I'll introduce our speakers momentarily. Just a word. Um, so I served in the U.S. government uh, for about 15 years, and for the last five years of that time, from about 1999 to 2004, I was the functional equivalent of the, the chief information officer of the U.S. or the deputy chief information officer of the U.S., uh, which the, the role changed when the Clinton administration uh, moved on to the Bush administration from the from a career position which I held to a political appointee in the U.S. government, which uh, the Bush administration introduced. And that position still exists uh, in the U.S. government. And this topic of e-governance is one that, even when I was in that position in the U.S. government, Estonia, I kept hearing these stories about it. these incredible things are happening in Estonia. And, um, and so looking at, at, at things that were happening, as, as you heard uh, earlier from the introduction, uh, it was really an interesting case study of things that the U.S. and other, other nations could learn from. So, so we uh, did model a number of our open government initiatives after some of the open cabinet um, uh, meeting proceedings that uh, Estonia pioneered uh, at that time. Uh, and also, um, the, the topic that you'll hear this morning, our, our main speaker will talk uh, as in from the position of chief architect uh, in the Estonian uh, Information System Authority. And this, this role, this combination of sort of technical and enterprise architecture with governance is really a key to making technology work for the mission of government. It's certainly something that we've learned in the U.S. when we set up a, 
uh, e-government strategy 15 years ago, enterprise architecture was at the core of, of that strategy, and we now still have a, a U.S. federal enterprise architecture, and I'm sure we'll hear uh, similar um, experiences from our speakers. So I'm very interested to hear the discussion. I'm, I'm sure that uh, we'll learn a lot. We'll be a lot smarter in about an hour, and uh, I know that we'll, um, we'll get some great learnings from our, from our guests, and then we'll be able to get into a discussion, I think, uh, toward the end of the hour. So let me then introduce uh, our speakers. Um, uh, Andres Kut, who is uh, the Chief Architect uh, for the State Information System Agency and the Information System, uh, Information System Authority in Estonia. Uh, Andres uh, did spend time in the U.S. In, in the world of higher education at MIT uh, recently, and uh, also is a graduate of the Business School in Estonia and the University of Tartu. He's also spent time in the private sector uh, with the Nordea Bank uh, in Estonia, and has had a number of, uh, of positions, including a position with Skype. Um, uh, so all of us who actually call people on Skype can probably thank Andres for helping to make that capability uh, work very well. So thank you for that. Uh, Andres will be doing the bulk of the presenting. With him is his colleague, Lena Arn. Um, hello, Lena. Welcome. Uh, Lena is the head of international relations for the Estonian Information System Authority, which is a position she's held uh, now for a little over a year. Uh, prior to that, she actually worked in NATO uh, as the cyber... Um, at the Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, uh, and she holds an honorary title of a NATO CCD COB, um, COE ambassador. So we will call you Ambassador Aring. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, she has a long career uh, working with the Estonian Ministry of Defense uh, in many different positions uh, and uh, studied also in, in Oslo. Uh, both of them speak many languages, so depending on uh, your uh, comfort in, in uh, the questioning, you might try a different language if English isn't, isn't working for you. Uh, and I know We'll have a terrific discussion. So, without further ado, let me welcome to the stage Andres. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm an engineer at heart and um, by profession, and therefore I always cherish and appreciate these opportunities to talk to non-technical audiences because this makes me think about things that usually I don't think about, like um, how to actually make the technology work with the existing business processes to have it utilized for, for governance. So today I'm going to talk about the evolution of the Estonian digital ecosystem, opportunities and challenges of e-governance. Uh, but the idea here is not to sort of define the discussion, to not to give you sort of, this is how you do things. And if you do this, you will be prosperous kind of things, but rather give you a frame of thought as to how to think about things. And um, I'm certainly um, not going to tell you what you should be doing. I should, I'm rather telling you how we have approached things. And um, maybe that's, that's useful. Firstly, I'm going to talk about what the Estonian digital infrastructure consists of, so that you have some understanding as to what, I'm, what it is that I'm talking about. Um, then, I'm going to cover a little bit about how this all fits together, because having technical solutions is one thing, but actually having that work together with the legislation, business processes, and the social processes is, is a completely different thing. And uh, finally, I'm going to cover a little bit about um, what are the digital enablers that have allowed Estonia to actually be where it is now? Um, there are a couple of interesting things, things there. And finally, some conclusions. Uh, but let me emphasize this once more. How we develop our so solutions is more interesting than what we have actually built. Because probably, probably something that works in a country of 1.3 million people does not necessarily work exactly like that in, in a country of US magnitude. Stuff just doesn't scale like that. However, it is a high chance that the approach, the methodology, the thinking, the, the mental models applied, that those can be taken over, the, those can be useful. So I tried to move away from actually trying to tell you what the exact digital solution is or technical solution is and more as to how we, how we got there. Uh, 
And the other thing I'd like to emphasize is that we should talk about digital embracing government, not e-government. Right? The difference is subtle, but, but still significant, I think. With, with the e-government, you have this implication that you have this government over there, and you have this e-government over there. And this is a completely separate thing in a corner somewhere which is the domain of the IT, IT people and doesn't really concern the actual government part at all. I think that's a big mistake. Um, technology should be seen as something that enables better governance. That it is something that allows and drives change in the governance, rather than something that is just bolted onto the existing government processes in the hope that somehow awkward stuff done faster is less awkward or more useful. It's just awkward stuff that is done faster. Uh, so let's talk about the digital infrastructure we have. Uh, so that's the basic enterprise architecture picture that we have. Um, our agency's name is Estonian Information System Agency in singular, which means that we really perceive our system as one entity. At the same time, the basic principle of democracy is to actually disperse power, to make sure that there is no concentration of power anywhere in particular. And therefore, we are facing this challenge of how do we have those agency silos form a co coherent information system. And that's how we do it. What the layers actually mean and what they contain, I'm going to go into, into slightly more detail in a minute. But it is important to understand that we have the technical layers, the architecture layers that we also use as a framework of governance, framed by two sort of fundamental processes on site. Firstly, we have finance and portfolio management where we actually drive, well, that's basically a stick and the carrot, to drive desirable behavior from the agencies. Um, we fund projects that uh, we like, that help agencies move towards this one coherent picture that are useful for e-governance um, or digital governance and for the entire Estonian ecosystem. And we deny funding for projects that we see as, super, uh, as, as unnecessary. For example, two agencies come to us applying for the funding, both, and we, we perceive that as a, those both solutions as being highly overlapping. We don't approve funding unless they actually talk to each other and come with a joint, joint proposal saying, hey, this is, this is how we will work together and this is we will avoid uh, waste. And on the other side, we have information security. I firmly believe that information security deals with failures of architects. If something is insecure, if something is difficult to defend, that's an architect's failure. We must design things that are defensible. Therefore, the architecture of all the layers, the architecture of the enti entire information system must have feedback from the information security world. And the other way around, of course, changes coming in from the fund funding part Changing, changes in all the layers and the information systems, they drive changes in information security processes as well. All right, so let's go over the layers very briefly. The electronic identity. Um, we have a chip card, smart card, um, which relies on uh, certificate authority that is external. That is a government has a stake in that CA, but um, it's a separate organization. Um, that so those certificates can live also on the SIM card, so in your mobile phone. And digital signature is legally equivalent to a physical one. So that if I digitally sign something, and this is where actually a lot of confusion happens, is that sometimes I get um, sort of, for example, a patent sort of paperwork from US, and uh, I'm, I'm told that I need to sign this digitally. And I, 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 I rejoice, I can, I can do digi digi digital signatures. And then it turns out I actually need to find an iPad and sign it on the, sort of, on the screen. Um, but in our case, it is actually a digital signature that actually cryptographically computes a hash of the, of the document and encrypts it. And that's legally equivalent to a physical actual signature. Um, the chip does not contain that much information at all beyond the personal ID code of, of every citizen. This is something that, um, that is very much a cornerstone of our system is that Every person is uniquely identifiable. Um, and um, 
We also have a bank-driven federated identification scheme that is widely adopted by stakeholders. Basically, you log into a bank and you get handed over in a secure fashion to a, to a government agency. Um, and this illustrates very neatly sort of strategic alliance between the public and private sector. Because you know, an average citizen interacts with the government two or three times a year. And whatever you do, probably saving a couple of minutes from two, and two or three interactions over the year isn't going to help you much. Also, if you need to identify yourself two or three times a year, do you remember a password or a PIN code that you only use twice a year? You won't, right? At the same time, you, make, you pay your bills, you interact with the bank daily, weekly. And um, this creates a situation where the banks can benefit from the digital signature because that takes away from the, uh, from the risk portfolio because they can now say that this payment order was signed digitally and that's equivalent to a physical signature. So what do you mean you, you didn't make the transaction? Right? And the government can actually benefit from, uh, from banks driving authenticated customers to, uh, to digital services. On the channels layer, um, we have a central government portal called ASTE.E which has 800 plus government services available, um, which relies on the um, next architectural layer I'm going to talk about in a minute for services. Um, but in addition to the central portal, we also have hundreds of direct contact points with the different agencies. Um, and the main challenge we, we see here is that um, how to maintain central, central coordination while still preserving sort of service ownership. So let's say a, a Minister of Agriculture wants to have, let's say, a registry of foxes. All foxes in Estonia need to be in registry somewhere. So how do we publish that service in the central portal in a, in a way that still makes the Minister of Agriculture responsible for the entire service, responsible for the um, business process of registering all the foxes, while still having this as a sort of part of unified central service portal that creates a disconnect that we have a challenge to, to overcome. And it is it's unfortunate that public servants really don't like to think in terms of customers. For whatever reason, that seems to be the case everywhere I, I, I speak at, and uh, it is a real challenge making people think of, of, of customers. Uh, we do have um, a central set of um, rough recommendations of how to build a, a government portal or government uh, web service, but we don't have a central set of guidelines and we are st struggling with mobile. Um, this is one of, the, one of our weakest points is that we haven't embraced mobile technologies to the extent we would love to. It is not a massive concern because as I said, two or three times a year you interact with the, with the government, you can live with that if the UI is a little bit clunky and doesn't look good in a mobile phone, but this is something that we definitely need to deal with uh, in the coming years. And integration layer. Now, I think this is the key sort of building block. This is the sort of central pillar of, uh, on top of which everything else relies. We have a distributed service bus called XROAD. And uh, what this allows us to do, or actually allows agencies to do, is to exchange information. Um, we have thousand, more than 1,000 usable services on, on, on that XROAD available to different agencies. And we are, we are constantly de developing that infrastructure. And what this practically means is that it de facto enables once-only and various privacy policies. Once-only policy means that if government already has a piece of information about the citizen, they are not actually allowed to ask, it, ask for it again. So if I interact with any government agency, it is enough for me to authenticate myself, provide that ID code, and from that, the agency can, can derive my name. They, don't, they must not ask for my name again. Um, and um, um, why, why is it this? Why do we have this policy? Um, sounds good on paper. Um, and for a, for a political sort of process, or a policy, policy process rather, 
uh, we try to find out where it is actually set that or said that this once-only policy is a policy. And we actually couldn't find it. It's one of those things that everybody knows that you're not supposed to do, but it's actually not written down anywhere. Um, and the reason it works is that it is actually easier for an agency to fetch a piece of information about the citizen sort of online over the integration layer rather than ask for it again and then store it and keep it up to date and make sure that it's actually sort of accurate and prevent it from, from, from being stolen. It is actually easier to ask for that piece of information from a different registry. And uh, this is where the privacy policies come in. Um, XROAD effectively allows us, to, allows us not to have this master database with all of the information. All of the agencies have their own registries. Like there's a Ministry of Agriculture with their registry of foxes, and there's a dispersions registry, and there are other registries. And if there is a breach in any of those registries, and inevitably there will be, there is no such thing as a completely secure system, then the, only, that sort of, only that part of the information system is breached. There is no way to sort of walk away with, with the entire um, data set um, the government has about the citizen. A, a very practical example of this is um, um, the driver's license. Uh, our our road, road authority that issues driver's licenses um, recently figured out that uh, they don't actually need to take pictures of people. You know, you're, you're on your driver's license, there's a picture of you. But the authority went, wait a minute. But these people at the uh, police and border guard agencies, they already issue the ID cards. And they already take pictures of people. So why do we actually redo this? And uh, a field was added to a one service, because they, you still need to sort of present your, your ID, ID document when you get your, your driver's license. So there needs to be an integration where the validity, validity of that document is verified. A field with a picture was added to that X road service. And uh, the road authority is able to save uh, or shut down this, um, this, um, this, those photo booths they had. And they're saving enough money to pay for the entire integration layer in five or six years, adding one field pays for the entire infrastructure in five to six years. So that's how sort of financially beneficial that integration layer is. And it's really a cornerstone of, of, of what we have. Um, and underneath everything, there's infrastructure. In this area of, of cloud computing, we often forget that, well, there's still, there's still going to be some, some computer somewhere, some hard drive somewhere that actually stores this information, that actually does the compu computation. Um, and we are um, working in, um, in this field aggressively. Uh, we are seeing platform as a service as our vision. We are by far not there yet. Um, and we are currently having mainly consolidated network access for the government services, which provides the government agencies with fairly easy integration points into the telcos or internet service providers. And from the other hand, provides our agency with the ability to do sort of joint network monitoring for the entire government system and um, to, uh, to um, support agencies in, uh, in resolving cyber incidents. And we see the government cloud as a combination of private cloud, public cloud, and data embassies. And I probably should say a couple of words about data embassies. You see, Estonia is um, very dependent on e-services. And when I say very dependent, I, s I mean, like, we are literally not able to have business processes without the digital services. Estonian business processes, governance processes are, and legislation has been for, for, for the past 10 years designed around information systems. They are designed to embrace the technology. Therefore, when the technology is not there, we don't know how to do things. Yes, in theory, you can always fall back on paper, but over the 10 years, that actual practical capability of handling that stack of papers has been lost. Therefore, e-services are really, really crucial for us. So that's one thing. The other thing you should know about Estonia is that it's about that size. Um, in the IT world, there is something that's called sort of layered net data center um, division. And on layer four, um, you should have data centers, your, your, your primary and secondary data centers, 
250 kilometers apart, which basically means that if, if a, there's a natural disaster on, on one of them or a massive electrical failure, there's a high chance that the secondary site is going to be unaffected. Uh, there is unfortunately no way to do this in Estonia um, without putting one of those data centers effectively next to a certain border and the other one on a tiny island. So what do we do? What do we do is that we actually extend the territory of Estonia. Uh, we figured out that it is actually possible to use Estonian embassies as sort of extensions of that virtual um, data center framework of ours. And so we're deploying services actually outside of Estonian boundaries. And we're trying to, by doing that, we're trying to redefine what it actually means to have a country in a, in a, in a digital sense. Um, but this is not enough. This is just the technical view. The thing is that the described model is lacking. It's um, no technical solution really exists in a vacuum. Um, democracy needs different tools from a theocracy. The, both are legitimate ways to run a country, but you know, they need different tools. Um, structure of government. Estonia is a very small country with two layers. You have a government and you have municipalities. In the US you have federal layer in addition. And that is going to change the way systems are built, the way the architecture is designed. Um, what registers are there? there? For example, in the US case, there is no central, as far as I know, central registry of all citizens. There is just, there is, it's not there. So therefore, the functional architecture must be distinct from what we have in Estonia. And also the physical constraints of, uh, um, basically, yeah, the Estonian size sets some physical constraints that you guys don't have, or some other countries. While, let's say, an island nation in the, uh, in the middle of the ocean is going to have slightly different challenges there. So the question is, how do you build a governance model that encompasses all of those aspects while still making technical sense? Because in the end, I'm, I sp speak from the point of, um, or perspective of, of an engineer, so I still like to be able to build stuff based on an architectural model. So what we have come up with is an enterprise architecture model that actually divides the organization or government into layers. You get business architecture. Basically, this is what your constitution says. says. That the fundamental thing that you are a democracy and not some other governance model and so forth. You get organizational architecture, which, which uh, basically defines your ministries, your agencies, your uh, business processes. You get your functional architecture, which defines what registers are there. How do they interact? Do you have a, for example, do you have a vehicle registry that is linked with population registry? Or do you have just the population registry or just the vehicle registry? How are those related to land registries? Um, and so forth. You get technical architecture, which is the layers I, I described you. The identification, the um, servers, the integration layers and so forth. And you have physical architecture that tells you about uh, what the physical setup is to, uh, are you able to build a uh, decent network of data centers, what are the network challenges, and so on and so forth. And um, what this model actually gives us is an ability to see the government as a holistic entity. Let's take this um, data embassies idea. Data embassies is a, is a question or, or a concept on the technical architecture. Let's just move some servers to the let's say, Swedish embassy of Estonia. Technically, it's fairly, fairly simple to do. We can, we can do that. We can do encryption. We can do VPNs. We can do all sorts of interesting things on the technical architecture and on the physical architecture. And on the, even on the physical architecture, we get challenges because now the embassies need to have a physical place for that server. Do they have that? I'm not entirely sure. We need to establish that. Functional architecture. OK, so you have one registry out, out of Estonia. If something happens to the main registries in Estonia, then that registry is going to be fine. But uh, will that registry in Sweden be able to sort of function on its own without relying on something else? Yes, we, we, we might have a, a vehicle registry out there, but if it only contains the ID code of the owner and, and no name and, and no driver's license information and whatsoever, then how useful is it? And it becomes a challenge of the functional architecture. 
So organizationally, um, we have a legal setup where there's a very specific organizational owner to all pieces of data. There's a ministry or an agency or a department of an agency responsible for maintaining integrity and security and confidentiality of every piece of data. And again, taking the data embassy example, we move that registry out to the Sweden and something happens to the agency that's responsible that is physically still in Estonia. We, we are not going to be moving a, an, an agency to Sweden. So how do we resolve that in a, in a legal setup? How, how is the responsibility resolved in that situation? And on the business architecture, the very fundamental questions about the governments, governance, what does it mean to have data embassies, to have data distributed over the world? What does it mean in, in the concept of, of the state? What does it mean to the fundamental sort of what a government, a state used to be this thing that you, had, you could sort of draw a border around. That's no longer the case. All of a sudden we can have a government that's almost devoid of, of the physical sort of uh, manifestation. Let's say little green men pop up all over the Estonian countryside. Can we move our country into the digital world? Um, and these are the thoughts that this sort of enterprise architecture view of the government allows us to, to have. Um, changes in all of the layers actually impact the others. Um, when we change legislation on the organization architecture, we need to change function architecture, we need to build systems. When we, design, when we decide to do sort of technical advances like the data embassies, we need to think of the other layers. Uh, so what allows us to have these? these wonderful things and allows us to have this luxury of actually being there. I think it is very easy to see Estonia as one of these, like, like some, somebody said, digital Narnia. This wonderful wonderland where everything is digital and Estonia is this chosen nation that somehow is magically born with a computer in their hands and, and are very fluent in these things. That's not the case at all. The thing is that we don't have another choice. We cannot afford the country without the benefits that digital governance brings. So we are there because we did certain things right, not because we are a somehow magically, uh, magically chosen, chosen country. So where does our digital um, background come from? Where, where does it, why, why are we able to do these things? What are the things that actually have driven us to build that sort of infrastructure we have? First, I think it's, it's vital to have trust and collaboration between stakeholders. And preferably externally guaranteed trust. Um, I already brought the, brought the example of digital signature. In, in an interaction between a citizen and the bank, the government provides an external sort of legal guarantee that that digital authentication method, the electronic identity that is used by the citizen, is actually equivalent to the physical one that assures that that interaction is, is trustworthy on both sides. Um, at the same time, the interaction between, let's say, um, citizen and the government in terms of e-election is secured or, or externally guaranteed by cryptography. The citizens know how, or, well, they can know, they are, that's public information, how the cryptography works and they can trust in that. It's, it's, it's transparent. Um, and these sorts of things are important because trust tends to erode over time and there needs to be something that keeps it, keeps it stable. And in, in, in our view, only very wealthy countries can afford not to have that trust. I found one example, the IRS. IRS lost 5.2 billion to identity theft in 2013. I've been told that the, the numbers for 2014 are uh, bigger. And just to sort of put that in perspective, when we convert that as a percentage of GDP, that would mean that Estonia would have lost roughly 6 million euros, which is basically more than the budget of our agency. We have like 120 people or something like that in our agency. And I can tell you that, that if, if Estonian Tax and Customs Board lost 6 million euros a year, that would be a problem. 
So we really can't afford not to have that trust. But it's also about trust between engineers, politicians, and administrators, but also banks and the government. At some point in our history, we had a situation where we had the, uh, Europe's youngest uh, prime minister called Mart Lahr. And he, he, he was, a, for crying out loud, he was a history teacher who became a prime minister. Like, how do you, zero experience in, and he went on and, and did tax reforms and, and land reforms and all, all of these things. But he had an advisor. Um, and that guy told him that, look, we can't afford bureaucracy. We simply cannot afford it because we don't have anything. And the way to avoid bureaucracy is, look, these computer things, these are really useful. Let's go digital. Let's avoid bureaucracy and the feedback loop that the bureaucracy creates of creating new bureaucracy. Let's avoid that by going digital. And because that history teacher, having no background in, te in technology or economy or governance or anything but history, um, he trusted that, that advice. There was a trust there. And he took that advice. And that is something that underpins many, many, many decisions we have made, is that there is a trust between policymakers, administrators, and the engineers. There is a discussion going. Of course, it's not perfect. Nothing ever is, but um, it still works. And it is very, very important to what we have. Um, the other thing we really can't live without is ubiquitous electronic identification. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> and the assurance level of service provided is dependent on, on how well you can identify somebody. And the British way of using utility bills and so forth, that, that, that can be really helpful. Uh, but it only can, can go so far. You can't sort of have digital signatures based on a, on a, on a, on a utility bill. You need to have a strong form of, of um, um, electronic identification. But ubiquity part is, is something that is, is very important. Because if you, you only are going to use something that you perceive as being useful. Um, and as I said, a citizen doesn't really interact with the government that often. So they, they must have an inherent understanding that going digital is actually useful. Um, but also, the, that the users are acquainted with the risks involved. They know what happens when you give out your credentials some, to somebody. Let's take the same example of, of um, um, e-elections. The electronic elections in Estonia are executed over the interweb using the same chip card, your, your ID card with your PIN codes, and uh, you can vote from your computer, and uh, a surprising amount of people do. Um, and at that point, all of these sort of critics go, oh, but what happens if people hand over there? You, you, have, no, you, have, you have no control over that ID, uh, the chip card and the PIN codes, and people hand them over. And yes, that is true. However, people in Estonia, because they have used it, they are using it in their everyday lives, they have a very keen understanding as to what it means to hand over that electronic identification method to somebody else. That means that that person who gets that chip card and that, those PIN codes has a utter and complete control over your money, your property, everything. It is something that people realize very sort of broadly. It's very sort of deeply built into the society. and People, therefore, are very less likely to do that than in a society where, you know, chip card is just something that you have, but not something that you use every day. And uh, people actually have to find convenient to use it. Any identification method that is too crumblesome, and we are getting there with the adv advent of, of mobile phones, you know, chip card reader, you can have that on your computer, but on, not on your mobile phone, so we need to figure something out there. Uh, user actually has to find it convenient to use. Breathing room. When we started out, we had nothing. Estonia had no telco infrastructure, no legal basis. We had still had to build our, our, our um, regulations. 
and everything was in flux. Um, and that helps a lot, because if everything is in place by definition, any change would go against well-established rules. And in government setting, you have a regulation that tells you that you should be doing things in a certain fashion. And when one morning you, an, a, an official comes to work and doesn't do things according to the regulation, they are breaking the law. But that's kind of the definition of innovation, doing things today differently than you did yesterday. There has to be some level of, of breathing room, some level of flexibility there. Um, let's take the same sample of, example of, of um, users handed over from the banks to the, um, uh, to the Tax and Customs Board. I was working at a bank at the time, and as you remember, we developed the entire solution within six weeks. Because, you know, the Tax and Customs Board came to us and, and said that, hey, we have this challenge, we need to, the personal tax returns are about to be filed, and we need to find out, to, figure out a way how to authenticate people on there, because people, nev people never go to a, a tax and customs board and say, hey, could you please issue me a, an, a, an electronic identity? It was before the ID card. But they do go to bank to do that. So can we, can we have a cooperation there? And we went, sure. And we designed the protocol and implemented it and rolled it out. And today it would be, in a Estonian setting, it would be utterly impossible to do. I would imagine even contract negotiations would take, take six months not six weeks. There has to be some flexibility, some controlled chaos for the innovation to emerge. You, if you do everything by the book, if everything is very well controlled and sort of, if the lawn is very nicely manicured, you don't get much change, you don't get much innovation. Critical levels of critical competences. Um, and I think there are three things that if you want to have a digital government, you need to have these capabilities within the government organization. Firstly, ability to procure development. There must be an ability to act as a responsible customer, and this is surprisingly difficult. Um, doing vendor management in today's world is, is challenging. I've had a conversation with a representative of a large country that basically told me that they, have, they, they are struggling with, with uh, vendors because big vendors nowadays can dictate their conditions and can overwhelm even large and, and very well established and mature government uh, organizations. Um, when I came to be the Estonian chief architect, I had this naive vision that, oh, it's like an enterprise architect, right? I set up a, a sort of to this, this architecture board and we are just going to coordinate all the architecture decisions made in Estonia. And it's going to be wonderful. And it took me about a couple of weeks to figure out that that's not the case at all. Why? Because nobody in Estonian government actually makes, or actually made, no, it's, it's slightly better now, but still, the government doesn't make architectural decisions at all. Those decisions are made by vendors. So the first step is to have the government act as a responsible customer to pull those critical IP-defining, intellectual property-defining decisions into the government domain to take that from the vendors and then to coordinate those decisions. Also, there needs the ability to procure operations. Um, operating the service means controlling the data, so use of public cloud is, is a challenge there, but it can be used if, if, the, if the legal framework allows it and if the operational setup is, uh, is right. But what we have seen is that weak operate, operations lead to low service levels and loss of trust. If, you, if the government doesn't have the ability to provide or procure um, operations of, that, of, of those systems, people are not happy. If the, the service is only usable if, if it's there. You, you try to file your tax return once and, it, and you fail because the server was down. You try maybe, maybe once again. You try maybe the third time. But on the fourth time, you're going to take the paper. Right? So operations is important. And, and of course, information cybersecurity. This is vital. Uh, 
you can, I, I, I cannot imagine a setup where these sorts of competences can be bought in. These need to be inherent in the government agencies. Um, fundamentally, who will work out your electronic identity, identity scheme? The chip card we have is fairly simple to use, but it's cryptographically fairly complicated. It's not a trivial thing to figure out. Uh, it's the same applies to the um, digital signature formats, file formats we have, and the digital signature properties and the processes. I'm not even talking about electronic voting, which is cryptographically fairly complex. Building these things requires that competence to be in-house. Um, also, there's a question about whose cryptography do you trust, and can you make your own? It's a very, very, very valid, valid question nowadays. At least, I'm not taking any sides, but that's an important decision, and that must be an informed decision. Not something that, oh, I find a piece of code on the interweb that seems to do encryption, and that's going to be just fine. We can't take that approach, if you're a responsible government. And finally, how do you protect your service? If something is useful, if something is valuable, if something drives value for you, inevitably there are going to be people that don't like that. That's just how the world works. So you have to be able to protect those services. And this is, again, something that is a critical competence. And without those three, ability to procure development, ability to, ability to procure operations, and the information and cybersecurity, without these, these three competencies, it is really difficult to set up a digital government. In Estonia, where do these things come from? As I said, Estonia is not a magical wonderland. So where, where do we get these three things? Or those actually, those, those four things. Um, the trust comes from our independence process. There's this uh, popular meme that Estonia sang itself free. And to an extent, it's, it's certainly true. Um, our, our country is our own. There's a very sort of deeply ingrained understanding that we made our country. You trust your own children. That's where the trust comes from. Also, Estonian society is very small. Everybody knows everybody. Um, I've been building software for a living for more than 20 years. And at a financial organization, I had serious trouble explaining them that there is absolutely no way I can be fully independent in the procurement process because I have worked or, or being a colleague or, or being a contractor or a customer of all the IT companies in Estonia or people in those companies. It's a, it's a very small society, and that, that breeds trust. Ubiquitous electronic identity comes from two major projects to a, to a very large extent. is Tiger Leap and Look at World. Tiger Leap was a project in the 1990s. It still continues now, but the bulk of the work was done in the 1990s to bring computers and internet connectivity to Estonian schools so that kids from very young age would have a sort of this, this comfortable understanding relationship with a the computer. They, they would realize that computers are useful, they would have the basic skills to use them, and so forth. Look at World project was, was much more interesting in a sense that um, it allowed us to sort of express that strategic alignment I spoke about earlier um, between the government, who wanted to get rid of the bureaucracy or avoid building bureaucracy, um, banks, who had the need to actually get rid of physical branches to basically save costs, and telecoms, who needed to educate their customer base to actually sell them telecommunication services. And these three parties sort of combined their efforts uh, in the Look at World projects that um, provided education about computers to adults, provided internet connectivity, established um, internet access points all over Estonia. So in a library or at a school or, uh, or, or a small municipality, effectively within a couple of kilometers from everywhere in Estonia, there was a computer that was free to access that was connected to the internet. That was something that the Look at World project did. And of course, banks pushing for electronic channels was something that, um, that allowed that ubiquity to, to emerge. Breathing room, that comes from very simple ineptitude. 
Our prime minister was a history teacher. He simply did not know what to fear. And that's something that has been there a lot. If you don't know anything, you don't know what to be scared about, and you just go and do things. And we have been lucky. It has worked out. Um, it's, there's also this thing called Nordic cynicism and, and very practical mindset. In our climate, as opposed to what's happening outside now, um, in Estonian climate, uh, the winter comes fast and harsh. And unless you are prepared, you die. <laughs> there is no, not much time to think and figure out and maybe there's a better way to plant your grain or harvest it or do something. No. Winter comes, you're going to be prepared. But it's very, very practical, very sort of simple things. You need to be able to rely on stuff to work. Um, those critical competences come from uh, two major sources. We have Soviet um, education system. And um, there was this, uh, you might have heard this thing called Cold War, um, in which there was the struggle between the powers. And um, the Soviet government very rapidly realized that um, you can't very well throw poetry or cabbages at the capitalist dogs. You have to have bombs. You have to have, therefore, you have to have somebody to actually build those bombs for you. You have to have engineers. And so it was that the Soviet power, when I grew up, was the Soviet state was not able to supply, or actually was, a, was able to supply the, uh, my, my hometown with exactly two varieties of men's winter coats, if you were lucky to get one. At the same year, that same government was able to supply our school with a uh, class full of computers. That just indicates the focus. That means that there was a very strong sort of focus on STEM from the education system. And th at the same time, the society in itself didn't really express it, didn't really allow any sort of expression of yourself, basically, other than going into the computers. So that, that provided this, this fantastic outlet uh, for, for geeks like myself. And also there was this uh, local banks relying on local intelligent amateurs. Um, in 1990s, beginning of 1990s, um, Amazon was, was very young. Uh, no books were, were, were available. We basically had to figure out how to do stuff ourselves. Um, even though the Soviet education system was STEM-oriented, um, the computers we had were still sort of ages beyond what, what the West had and what, what started coming in when we regained independence. So there was a lot of this sort of, I have this thing that is expensive and I, I know it's useful, but how? And this intelligent amateur mindset uh, emerged. That was also, for example, in Estonian banks, I, to my knowledge, none of the banks that was actually started in Estonia, none of them bought their core, banking core, as a product. They were all built from scratch. Like um, four or five of them within a like, couple of years in Estonia. And some of them are still, still around. Amateurs, building stuff, making stuff happen. Uh, not relying on the, on the um, outside powers. And this drives competences. This is how we build competences. Or actually, we did. So, conclusion. Firstly, digital rather than e-government. The e must not be a separate thing on top of usual practices and processes, but something that actually drives change in the government. In order for this to be valuable, there must be a holistic approach to this. It is not sufficient for engineers to figure out how to do data embassies or digital ID or something else. That technical thing must be supported by legislation, by organization setup, by function setup, by technical setup, or the physical setup, and the other way around. If there's a legal change, it must go through all of the layers as well. This is how you understand success and failure. This is how you drive change. And finally, benefits stem from the ecosystem, not from individual systems. Building a website is simple. 
or as a certain president of a certain country said when he visited Estonia, uh, maybe not that simple, but um, nevertheless. Um, building a website is, is certainly doable, but getting people to use it, that's not trivial. Um, for traction, all stakeholders must benefit. Our e-governance would not be where it is, was it not for the banks, the telcos, the people themselves, uh, the private companies. I signed, I, I, met, um, I met my, I have a small apartment that I rent out and I had a new tenant uh, last year. I met him the first time uh, last week, digital signatures. We signed the contracts digitally. I, I didn't meet the guy at all, ever. Um, now, now he had to hand over, me key, uh, over the keys. But that's not something that is sort of part of the digital governance, but it is something that lives on top of the digital infrastructure provided by the government. And this is where the value comes from. This is where the savings come from. Not from me interacting with the government, but I, me interacting with my tenant, me interacting with the university, organizations interacting using um, that infrastructure. This is where the benefits and value comes from. And uh, thank you. So can I invite Lena to join us on stage and watch us in our next seat? Yep. Please go ahead. Um, so Lena, from your perspective, um, it, it's a terrific story over the last, so, but you've, you come from a ministry. Uh, within the within the uh, right the defense ministry within Estonia, how from the, the perspective of an of an agency serviced by this tremendous governance story from the central government, how was the interaction from the agency's perspective? Um, I, I I did come from a ministry. I now work together with Andres because I, I switched sides, but I uh, used to work in the Ministry of Defense at the time when we uh, when we had the uh, tremendous cyber attacks in two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. And when uh, this was considered as a major national security threat, and this was why the Ministry of Defense took the lead to, to develop our first um, cybersecurity strategy. Uh, but when um, the strategy was ready, when the structures were ready, when the uh, order was created out of chaos, everything functioned well, then we realized that um, actually the, uh, uh, the more proper place for cybersecurity should be not within the Ministry of Defense, but um, within a civilian organization. Mm -hmm. So we, we um, started to demilitarize this issue. And, and we handed over the responsibility for cyber uh, to the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. And now uh, we have a, a perfect um, mix there in the, uh, in the Information System Authority and, and in the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs and Communications, who sits on top of, of the agency, that we have the system um, builders, the architects, and mm -hmm. the system defenders under the same organization roof, which is quite, uh, quite unique, I believe, uh, in the world. And as Andres said, uh, that cybersecurity deals with, uh, with the failures of systems design. So we, we mm -hmm. try to, uh, or we, we have built at least a structure to, to, um, uh, to, to deal with, uh, with this problem. And and they, from the very start. <laughs> and our enterprise architects, the layered picture that, that I had, the integration layer actually allows us to separate the concerns very clearly. When I joined, when I started my job, there was a massive fight because I was perceived as this, this evil architect that tries to stomp <laughs> on everybody's uh, lawn because nobody likes anybody else to tell them in their little tiny kingdom what to do or what not to do. But the enterprise architecture picture we have developed allows us to draw very clear boundaries. Within that box of yours, within that agency, you are utterly free mm -hmm. to do whatever you find usable or suitable or, or get the financing for. However, the holistic picture is my domain. And that creates a very clear framework for communication and collaboration with the agencies and with the mm -hmm. central sort of uh, information system authority. Mm -hmm. So that's a, one of the very deliberate design goals of that enterprise architecture. So, uh, our center at IBM is, is in effect a think tank, and we work with governments around the world to learn from what's what the best of 
uh, what's happening in government and to share best practices uh, with other governments. So in that vein, you've sort of evolved this picture, as we've seen from your presentation, in a mix of technical and governance uh, specifications. Would you say that that's the best, if, if governments are learning to learn from your example in terms of sort of the order that they engage in, in, in to make a journey like this, is it you want to work on both tracks at the same time? Do Absolutely. you need a technical foundation first? Actually, actually, one would need legal and procedure, uh, proce procedural and business process foundation first. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the, the ID code being set up, the legislation about the digital signature, right. the um, data protection regulations, all of these things actually need to be in place before you start building something like XROAD. So I would even say that um, the sort of legal support, the, the business change should come before the technical change. Technical sh should be just something to, to mm -hmm. help achieve those goals there. Good, thank you. Any other observations, Lena, before I open it up for questions that you um, wanted to share? Yeah, maybe one thing that, uh, another thing that we're very proud of uh, in this cold, harsh climate there, <laughs> where we fight for survival, uh, is um, a thing called collective brain. We are an extremely tiny country, but we have come to appreciate uh, joint action or joint thinking that um, uh, we have realized that uh, you win, um, you win only when you when you when you think when you're together with uh, with uh, like-minded fellows <laughs> and when you develop this this collective brain. So we we put a lot of emphasis on uh, community building, and and we have integrated that into our national defense as well. Uh, also, when it comes to cyber, we have a a, um, a great uh, formation called uh, Cyber Defense uh, League, uh, or or Cyber Defense Unit of our National Defense League, which is a something similar to. Uh, Defense League is something similar to your National Guard, and the unit is, is underneath uh, uh, that uh, National Guard, a, a military structure. But the, the people uh, that participate in this uh, uh, formation are volunteers, and they have very civilian backgrounds. They usually have uh, well-paid jobs in, in banks, in ISPs, and they are, they are patriotically motivated, and they volunteer their free time in order to come together to exchange information, to, to train together. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that the government provides for them is a training range, a kind of cyber lab, uh, cyber, cyber range where they, can, uh, where they can train. And they, uh, they, they really enjoy it, to do something cool um, instead of, uh, or that brings them out of their regular boring um, IT jobs, uh, system administrators, etc. So this is a, uh, uh, this community building efforts are, are of, of great help and, uh, to great, us as well. And, and, it, and it doesn't come naturally to Estonians. The only difference between introvert and extrovert Estonian is that introvert Estonian is constantly looking at his shoes, and extrovert Estonian is looking at somebody else's shoes. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, nice it's, really, shoes. it's really well, something polished. you need to sort of focus and concentrate on. It doesn't really come naturally. Okay, good. Well, I know we probably have some uh, interesting questions in the audience. So let me start back here. And if you could just identify yourself. Interesting question, and thank you. I'm also a Kennedy School uh, alum, so good to see you here. Yep. Um, in the digital governance requires some sort of stability because those servers need to live somewhere. And that somewhere needs to be reasonably safe. So in, in an unstable setting, building a digital government is, is really difficult. However, the second half of your question was about exile governments. And this is something that we have, this is one scenario that we have really deeply thought about. Um, 
And let's imagine a scenario, or not, not that I enjoy imagining it, but let's, let's say something like, um, like happened in Crimea, happens in Estonia. And all of a sudden, there's these magical green men that somehow appear and, and there's an attempt at a referendum. What we can do in Estonia, or we would love to have the ability to, is to have public communication in Estonia saying, Estonians, let's vote. ID cards in your computer, let's vote. And you can start uploading all the votes to a neutral party outside of Estonia that's not under the control of those little green men. And you can have an actual democratic vote in that city. So these are the scenarios that we really, really think about. And it's becoming increasingly important, again, bringing an example from the Ukrainian uh, setup. One of the things, as far as I know, that the Ukrainian government did, it's the very first thing, was to cut the Crimea off from a population registry. That is, that was in the sort of rest of, uh, in, in Kiev, physically. And that meant that there was no way to actually have an understanding as to who, who lives in Crimea. So therefore, there is no way to actually have a legitimate Kind of, uh, kind of voting procedure. Though, so these things are becoming increasingly important in the, uh, in the digital governance world. And um, digital governance has a massive effect on these things and, and really broadens the perspective of things you can actually do. It effectively liberates your country or from the sort of physical world. You can move at least part of the function of your country into into virtual world, if, if you will. Uh, perhaps I can uh, only add that in addition to, to physical uh, stability, um, digital government also needs some sort of uh, political stability okay. uh, because um, our digital cover government rests upon transparency and uh, very low levels of corruption because you can't bribe a computer. So, um, <laughs> so that the, uh, some very basic, uh, uh, basic components of a, a democracy should, should exist in a state uh, but, that is a... But, but digital governance can also can, you, can be used to drive that, that transparency. And, uh, and as, as you said, computers are very difficult to bribe. As an engineer, I would say not impossible. But, uh, yeah. You agree at least. Yes, yes sir. Uh, back here. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is David Katz, and I'm formerly with the State Department. I'd like to ask you about the University of Michigan study of e-voting security and the fact that they have come out, Mr. Haldeman has made presentations which are fairly compelling, and they're out there, and challenging the whole, suggesting that perhaps e-voting is just, uh, uh, you know, just too hard to get to ever. And uh, you speak about security problems being architectural problems and stress the need for feedback to deal with those kinds of things. I've been a bit concerned, and I've been following this, to see that Mr. Haldeman's presentation, University of Michigan's presentation is out there, and I haven't seen a really compelling response in something like this, a peer-reviewed literature, or a real free discussion where a lot of these things were addressed. And I think some of the things Mr. Haldeman mentioned were not only kind of systemic kinds of things, but also operational things, uh, just simply things about locking doors and things like that. So I was wondering if you could address that, because the issues of trust that you mentioned, if you have trust from the outside eroding, it can have an effect in terms of eroding the trust within the population. Thank Absolutely. you. An excellent question. Um, and we are working to get sort of a second view on, on the issues that Mr. Halderman is, um, is putting forth. The thing is, though, that um, what Mr. Halderman is, is largely pointing out are technical issues. And it is really difficult to argue with that, because no technical system is fully secure. And he's absolutely right. There are security issues in every system. Every technical system has its flaws. As an engineer, I know that. So it is, from that perspective, it is really difficult to argue with him because he is to a very large extent right. However, what is not in that research is the holistic view of the things. The question is not whether or not e-voting is secure. The question is 
whether the voting system of Estonia is more or less secure when part of the voting happens electronically. And that's a very different question. For example, in Estonia, it is possible to vote as many times as you want with the last vote counting. So that if you have any issues voting digitally, you, you are forced, there is a technical breach, you have reason to believe that your computer was insecure. Or whatever you have, you can always go on the voting day and vote physically in a very old-fashioned way. And that vote is going to prevail. And the other thing is that our technical systems for e-voting sort of reflect the same procedure that is used by voting by mail, which is very established, very well researched. It's always there. It's basically step-by-step -step copies of the same procedure. So yes, technical systems are insecure. And yes, there are challenges. And yes, we are constantly working on improving that. However, it is not, a, not about technical sol solutions. It's about the holistic thing. And this is where we're struggling. We're actually struggling to find people in academia who are able to actually convincingly look at the entire thing, not just the technical aspects. And um, let me put this out. If, if there is any academic interest in, in research in this field, it uh, would be much, uh, much uh, appreciated because there is just, as you, as you pointed out, just one piece of evidence out there that is uh, very loud and, uh, yeah. So I think that's an excellent point in terms of risk, risk, risk trade-offs, mm -hmm. your point about there's, it's not like there's zero risk in the current Absolutely. system and there's significant risk in an e-voting system. It's a question of what system is more efficient relative to the risk. And so making those trade-offs for any government, I think, is, is an important point. There was a question over here. Yeah, let me see. Right here. Hello, my name is Jan Seedon and I work at the Center for Transatlantic Relations. I'm a visiting fellow from Finland and I have worked at the same bank as you have, Nordea. Okay. And one of my tasks in the bank was to convince the older people to move from the traditional banking to e-banking. And you didn't mention at all the challenge of how to convince the elderly people in Estonia to move to this system. So do you have any best practices in that field? Thank you. Excellent. Um, and that joke about the Estonians looking at their shoes was actually stolen from Finns. <laughs> so, um, thank you for that. Um, as to elderly, uh, it is a challenge, and, and this is why I actually mentioned the Look at, Look at World um, project, because that specifically targeted education to the elderly. Um, and um, in Estonia, we have this situation where the elderly don't necessarily have many other options, because the infrastructure is very poorly developed. And you might actually, in the winter, you might not get out of your house. So there is a sort of very strong drive to actually use electronic systems rather than just sit in your car and, and drive somewhere. So that sort of lack of infrastructure helps. And that is supported by the actual education providing you the tools to, to actually um, get things done electronically. So uh, <clears throat> perhaps not. Um, to elaborate a little bit on, 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 your, on your picture of Estonia as, as everybody living in, <laughs> in countryside and uh, deserted yeah. places yeah. covered yeah. With, with snow, then <laughs> the elderly nowadays, they're quite modern, actually, when you look at the, uh, the senior citizens in Estonia, oh, yeah. then they are um, uh, the Rolling Stones generation. So they can, yeah. they can find their ways in the internet. They can, they can book their plane tickets online. So mm -hmm. an Estonian e-government system is, is, is very user-friendly. It's very easy to... Um, to use your, your, your EID to authenticate yourself and to give digital signatures. And we have extremely high numbers of, of, of digital signatures. We, we give uh, almost 6 million digital signatures a year uh, with, for a population of 1.3 million people only. And that also involves the, 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 the elderly mm -hmm. <laughs> segments in the society. So I mean, they, they, they handle it quite well. I, I mean, say. Rolling Stones yeah. and Black Sabbath, how old are they nowadays? <laughs> As a member of the Rolling Stones generation, I'm now encouraged <laughs> to come and, come and visit. Yes, sir. Um, Aguet from the MITRE Corporation. And 
Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, we can speak uh, in different languages. Te olete väga hästi tööd teinud ja mul on hea meel, et te nii mainikalt oote Eesti ma ilma turule, eriti nii suure suurele foorumile. Now that I've expanded my Estonian vocabulary, I'll continue in English. Uh, Estonia has um, started the e-resident program, which is sort of an expansion of the digital borderless world. How is this going to impact your architecture? Is it going to require any changes or expansion? Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, yes, thank you. An excellent question. Uh, again, um, the e-resident e thing is a, is a challenge. It's, it's a big challenge architecturally because it doesn't require anything. It doesn't have an impact on any of the systems. Basically, what has happened is that um, from the technical or architectural perspective, e-residency is identical to every other resident we have. So the, I, the, the card is minted. There is certificates on the card. The person is issued an ID code. And from that point onwards, that person is going to look identical to every single Estonian citizen. So it doesn't require any changes whatsoever. And that is a challenge because the business processes need to change. We need to start providing things sort of in English language and so on and so forth. And these sorts of things are easier to implement if, if they come together with some architectural change, if you need to build a new system. But that need is not there. So we need to somehow sort of go and meddle with, with all of the components of the architecture to provide that, that decent experience for the, for the, for the user. So technical architectural changes, there are, there are none. But uh, fundamental sort of business process changes, there are many. And that difference is a challenge. Interesting. All the way in the back. I'm making the, uh, um, the mic get some exercise here. Sorry about that. Uh, my name's Keith Hill. I'm with Bloomberg BNA. And I'd like to piggyback on the question about the Rolling Stones generation and their use of e-services. And specifically, I want to ask, what about those individuals who are older than the Rolling Stones generation? Like, my mother's 89, and she couldn't use a computer if you put it in front of her and put a gun to her head. So what about individuals who are in their, let's say, mid-70s and older? Uh, what, what percentage of them are using e-services, or are the numbers too small? We'll call them the Frank Sinatra generation. <laughs> or, or the greatest generation. <laughs> Uh, when we look at the statistics of our um, last e-elections, then the largest uh, group who voted online was the people over 65 uh, years of age. Uh, so this is quite telling. And um, uh, maybe it's because of the Look at Work program that has, has helped a lot, uh, the elderly people to, to develop their skills. Um, maybe it's something else, that, um, that they live in this houses um, I, I, <laughs> in winter and they, this is the, the, I, I, the, the toy for them. No. Um, and and uh, just one, one more thing is that um, um, we also rely a lot of, on the, um, uh, of the grandchildren of, of these grandmothers and, and grandfathers. Mm. So if you have a, um, have a grandmother who's, who's not able to do, to do things digitally, then uh, she can actually pass that um, uh, pass that right uh, to somebody else in the family who can do it for for her. Uh, this is an option um, that is, is quite widely widely used as well. And one more thing is that it has been a deliberate and, and conscious strategy of Estonia for the past 20 years. And 20 years ago, that generation was 20 years younger, if I'm doing my math correctly, which means that they, they had the better ability to, to sort of study and, uh, and learn about things. So over time, this problem actually sort of alleviates itself as, as the generations that get, get better education sort of get older. So I think that is one of the key things. In the beginning, 20 years ago, definitely, it was a, was a much larger challenge than it is, it is now. But the rolling change, um, not rolling stones, but rolling change is, is helping there a lot. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Patrick Etzenpier. I'm formerly with uh, US Agency for International Development and now with uh, 
small consulting firm called the Public Management Group. I was particularly intrigued um, by the, the connections that you made between digital services, ubiquity, trust, and how, and not just an emphasis on the technical aspects of it, but at the very end, you started talking about some of the conditions which I think might be, th that are necessary for this to even to take place. You talked about a legal, procedural, and other environments. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that, please? It is very difficult to answer in, in a generic fashion. Um, I guess my message is that whatever the technical solution is you are building, and whatever the legal infrastructure is you are building, the legal procedural and business change must come before the technical change. If, it, if the engineers are allowed to run the world, that's a disaster, basically. That, that engineering, the technology must be used to actually complement and implement a business change. This is what I'm saying. Whatever that business change is, it must use technology, not the other way around. I think that's my sort of generic message. And who leads that process? Well, in, in your case, in Sonia's case, who led that process? This is where the collaboration comes in. It was led in conjunction from the policymakers to the engineers. There was a sort of trust and collaboration environment between those two parties, and that's crucial. Because that allows to develop policies and regu regulations and processes in a way that actually embraces digital. Without the engineering component in there, it's very difficult to do. And engineering is very difficult to do without the sort of legal uh, and, and procedural aspects. So that cooperation actually allows those two sides to drive that thing together in the, at the same time. But they must drive the legal part first, the business part first, and then technology. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as a follow-up to that question, in, in this country we've seen successes where business leaders in agencies or the, in, in ministries um, define their goals and objectives and then work in partnership. So, so there's, it's sort of an integrated project team, if you will, yep. where it's as opposed to we're doing the business piece here and then we're throwing it over the fence. How, how does that work in Estonia? Oh, very, very much the same way. There is a very strong correlation between a IT savvy focused business leader and successful implementation of systems. There's a very, very strong correlation. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Good. Any other questions for our, our guests? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Pete Baer with EnergyWire. Um, how effective is the sharing of classified cybersecurity threat information between defense agencies and civilian agencies and the uh, and, and, and private sector, and is this uh, dependent upon personal relationships to some important degree, or is it uh, really well spelled out in a in a in a system and in rules? You know, this is your turn. <laughs> yeah, um, this is dependent on um, on both personal relationship, uh, the community, and also some regulations um, that when the um, when we talk about vital service providers or the critical information infrastructure, then they, they have an obligation to report on the incidents. So it's not voluntary, it's obligatory. Uh, but um, uh, attached to that, we also are attached. Uh, apart from that, we also have a, a very strong community that uh, unites these people uh, through the, uh, the Cyber Defense League or through some other formats of cooperation that we have in, in all levels, strategic, operational, technical levels. Uh, and we also envisage to, to, to look at this pic picture on, uh, comprehensively, and this is also written to, uh, in, into our national cybersecurity strategy, uh, that we try to integrate um, the continuous operation uh, plans of the vital service providers with the national defense planning so that the uh, uh, the crisis preparedness would would uh, kind of work hand in hand with with the, with the military planning, and this is how the information gets ideally shared. Of course, it doesn't happen 100%, um, not even in Estonia, <laughs> but but we are we are getting there uh, through through regulation and and through this very strong community. And I believe that we actually get there faster through that 
uh, community than, than through regulation. So we, mm -hmm. we try to use carrots rather than sticks, even though we have the regulation in place. Um, following up on that question, one of the open legislative issues uh, in, this year in, in our, the U.S. Congress is a potential legislation that would provide liability protection to private sector firms to increase information sharing. And that's, this legislation, as I'm sure many people in the room know, has been sort of floating around for, for a couple of years. I've worked with CSIS in a number of capacities on similar issues. Is there a, le back to your point about policy coming first, is the legislative framework friendly to information sharing and in that there is similar protection to private sector companies who share information with government? Or is it more the interpersonal and, and close-knit nature of the community that really drives that? Um, I, I would say it's the latter rather than the former. Uh, we, uh, we, we try to regulate as, as less as we can, mm -hmm. but, but there, there needs to be some basic regulation in place. But, uh, but I, I would say that it is rather the, uh, the, the strong sense of community and, uh, that enables us to uh, sharing. Fund fundamentally, a situation has been created where the community is so strong that people perceive being able to be in that community as a sort of almost requirement to be able to do their job. Because unless you are within that community, you are cut off from your information sources. You can't share information. You can't get the news anymore. And uh, unless you are in there, you basically can't do your job and you can't get an, uh, a new job either. So in, in such an environment, sharing information becomes fairly, fairly easy. Mm. That's true. If you're a bad kid on the black block, then you're cut off your future positions. Nobody wants to play with you. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, the wisdom of the crowd at work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Terrific. Well, I think we're about at the end of our hour. Are there any final thoughts that you wanted to share before we, before we close? Just a big thank you for the very good questions, I, yes. I guess. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for coming. And <laughs>